speaker is going to talk about the relationship between communities and content. And in 2003, Rob Hinchcliffe founded the collaborative, award-winning blog, Londonist. Since leaving, he's also edited Yahoo UK News. He's helped launch and grow the user-generated review sites, and also conceived and managed products, including JK Rowling's Pottermore, as part of the strategy team at Think. And many of you know JK Rowling. If you don't, she's the successful author behind the Harry Potter books. A little fact about Rob. He's actually got a lifetime ban from 10 Downing Street. He doesn't look like a criminal. Uh, 10 Downing Street is the seat of power of the UK. It's where the Prime Minister of the United Kingdom resides. And what happened, he was invited there and decided to take a whole load of photos of inside down Downing Street, put them on Flickr. Within 48 hours, 10 Downing Street got in contact with him, and hence the lifetime ban. So that's uh, an unknown fact about Rob that is now very well known, particularly with live streaming on the web as well. And today we have the opportunity to explore the ways in which we can engage people in new environments defined by the digital world. So let's discover how we can engineer our products to react and adapt to its context. Please give a very warm welcome to the man that's been banned from 10 Downing Street, Rob Hinchcliffe. <laughs> Thank you for that. Nice to see you, Rob. Good to right. see you. Hello, everyone. Thank you for that introduction that makes me sound like a terrorist. Um, yes, so today I'm going to talk about producing and consuming content in a, in a multi-platform world, and I'm going to try and do this in the medium of LEGO. Um, no, I'm not actually going to build LEGO on the stage, because that would be time-consuming and very boring for you, but I'm going to use it as a kind of a visual metaphor as we go along. So, um, as you've heard, I am banned from 10 Downing Street, but I also used to work in publishing. I'm a journalist, kind of by training. I used to be about 10 years ago, 15 years ago. Um, and then I started uh, this, this collaborative kind of blog um, that became Londonist. I worked for Yahoo as their kind of UK. Uh, they didn't sack me for getting uh, banned from 10 Downing Street. I worked for them as the UK kind of news editor for a couple of years. I worked at a startup doing a kind of a ratings and reviews and recommendations site. Uh, people powered. Um, I've worked for an agency, so I've worked for brands like Warner Brothers and Channel 4 in the UK. And JK, it's pronounced Rowling, by the way. If you pronounce it Rowling, she gets really upset. Um, yeah, <laughs> thank God. Um, and yeah, brands like ASOS and things like that. And I work at Rushmore, which is a social music site. Now, what this tells you about me is that I get bored easily, but also I am kind of fascinated by the way that content, the actual kind of meat and bones of the web, um, and how we as users and an audience interact with that content, and the kind of how we affect that content, and how that content affects us and our relationship with each other as, as a kind of community. And that's kind of what I want to talk about today. Um, this is the, the ape from the start of 2001, the Space Odyssey, anyone? Um, you know, when they're playing with the bones and they realize they can use them as weapons and tools. It's a, it's a kind of stretched metaphor for evolution. Um, but I just want to talk very quickly about how the web has evolved. It's a kind of a quick two-minute two history lesson, because I don't think we can talk about the web and where we are now without just going and looking back and thinking about how we got here. Um, the web started as a kind of giant buzzing communications switchboard. It was Usenet groups and email and one person communicating to many or one person communicating to another person. Um, message boards, bulletin boards, that type of thing. Um, and it kind of quickly evolved when brands and organizations got involved, and they started kind of, the web became much more of a, a rough copy of our kind of commercial real life infrastructure. So you could go into a virtual shop and buy some things instead of going into a real shop, or you could download the PDF of the magazine instead of going into your news agents and buying it. And it was a very simple, kind of mirrored version of what we do in real life, and it kind of it was crude, but it kind of took the web into a much more mainstream audience because we recognized these interactions and we were able to kind of identify with them. But it wasn't very, there was no interaction. We weren't influencing what we were doing. We were just kind of replicating what we were doing in the real world. And then, how long has it been since someone stood on a stage at a tech conference and said Web 2.0? It kind of sounds like saying steam power, doesn't it? But um, Web 2.0 came along and it was where the kind of the first version and the second version of the web had kind of met, had a few drinks, 
gone back to the hotel, had a good time, and given birth to this new thing, which was kind of communication, but through this kind of, it was enhancing what we were doing in the real world rather than just mirroring it. So for the first time, we were, to, we were told we could create profiles and add friends and have preferences and have recommendations given to us based on those preferences. And although kind of Web 2.0 sounds archaic and weird, and it sounds like you know steam power, it, it's, we're still kind of living in that kind of paradigm that we haven't really moved on. You know, this is still, this, I've just described Facebook. So I want to kind of look at where we are, what's next, and what's driving this kind of evolution, this next step. And it's kind of being, we're kind of being forced to evolve as kind of producers of content and producers of web-based stuff by our audience, by our users. And I kind of want to look at those behaviors. Before I do that, I want to talk about Super Mario, but also about gamification. Um, gamification, apart from being a, a horrible verb crime, is um, it's kind of the, the word we give to putting gaming mechanics on top of web interactions in order to keep people engaged. And I think gamification came about as a kind of, almost as a panic reaction to this idea that we didn't know what was coming next. And we were seeing engagement levels coming down. We were seeing our audiences getting bored with what we were giving them because as we'll see, you know, with all these amazing devices, and as you know, we were talking about yesterday, these kind of blended realities and second screens and third screens and fourth screens, the hardware is moving on, and the content that we're getting delivered to us on that hardware is not really keeping up. Um, and the gamification, I think, was a bit of a reaction to that. I said, OK, let's give people badges and prizes and trophies and stickers, and then maybe that will make them come back. So we kind of saw this four squareification of, of the web for a little while. And when it was done well, it was done great. But when it was done badly, it was bloody awful. Um, my, the, one, the example I always go to is the T Get Glue, which is like a TV watching community site where you basically got given a virtual sticker for watching a television program. Um, and coming back to Lego for a second, um, see, there is method to this. I'm not just doing it because Lego is fun. Um, Lego, the, the name of Lego comes from those two Danish words, Legot, um, and it, which means to play well. And it's an interesting concept, I think, playing well, because it, it assumes that there's also playing badly. And I think gamification, to a large extent, was playing badly, because playing well means that it's something meaningful, that you're learning, that you fail at something, and then you challenge yourself, and then you succeed at it, and you progress. Getting a sticker for watching a TV program is not any of those things. There's no meaning involved, there's no challenge, there's no learning or anything like that. So gamification, to a large extent, was not playing well, it was playing badly. And I think the reason it was done so crudely and so many times was because we were, it was a bit of a panic reaction. We weren't really thinking it through. And so I want to look at kind of what our alternatives are. So just over the next 30 minutes or so, I just want to look at kind of what's driving these new behaviors. I mean, this is, this is the obelisk from 2001, by the way. Um, it's as a, another kind of stretch metaphor for evolution. But um, I keep having to explain this, I feel. I think you've probably got it. Um, so what's driving these new behaviors and kind of what challenges for people who work on the web, what, what they create for us, and kind of how we can make the best of those challenges and, and kind of see them as an opportunity to do something. So as I said before, uh, people expect, I mean, uh, the devices that we have now, we carry around with us. We, they, they expect, people expect the content on those devices to know where they are, know when they are, why they're looking at it, who else is on it. These things are, these things there, and what used to be called the semantic web, but I guess is now called the uh, the open web. After people didn't really like that term, the semantic web. The kind of the metadata that sits around all of this content, so the comments and the tags and the geo tags and everything that's kind of the ectoplasm of the web, which kind of sits around it. They expect us to use that in a in a way which you know is, is relatable to them and gives them context. And social. Social media, terrible term, it's not a media anymore. It's social is th throughout everything we do. You don't think of having to build something, go, oh, should we make this social? It's going to be social, so it's omnipotent. So people expect all of these things, and we're having to deliver stuff which has all these things running throughout them. Creativity. Um, digital native, there's more creativity and innovation um, about at the moment, and for a reason, um, digital natives, which is, you know, or those pesky kids, as I like to call them, people who are younger than I am, um, people who grew up with the web and don't know any different. These people are now going into jobs, which makes me feel incredibly old, but they're taking that kind of 
the fact that they're incredibly familiar with the web and the digital, and they've never known any different, and they're taking that into environments where the web has never been before, and there's less dissent in those environments as a result. So we're seeing the web kind of infiltrating industries and infiltrating organizations and brands and all, all that kind of thing without when less dissent because people are just coming from university and going straight into these jobs and going, well, where's the web? Where's the digital? And fans and people are consuming this stuff are much more fickle these days because they have a lot more choice. We're giving them loads of different channels, giving them loads of different content to do with. And as creators of content, we're having to be much more innovative and imaginative to make ourselves stand out to them and get them and keep them and keep them loyal and engaged. So that kind of is forcing our creativity. Uh, technology, duh. It would be stupid of me to stand up here and not talk about technology. But I just want to, it's kind of this idea of convergence. It's, convergence is one of these buzzwords that's been around at conferences for about five, six years, and kind of like any buzzword, the meaning gets rubbed off a little bit, I think. But I think now we're actually seeing genuine convergence. I know that's like me saying, I think this is the year of the mobile. But I think we are really seeing convergence now, and different industries having, because digital is not a channel anymore. It's not a different industry. It's, like I say, it runs through everything that you do. And it's, not about, it's about survival. As an industry now, you have to do, be doing something digital, otherwise you're just not going to survive. It's just like saying, oh, no, I'm not going to do print, or I'm not going to do television. You have to do digital, otherwise you're not getting your stuff out there. And this idea of amateurization, because the barriers to entry to technology are so low these days, the, the, the ability to learn and develop stuff, this idea of what you know, used to be called the bedroom producer, is now the guy in the coffee shop with an iPad producer. Anybody can sit down and make a piece of music or create a layout or print something, or print their own head and throw it out at a conference. You know, we saw that yesterday. John was controlling his 3D printer from his phone back in New York with his eight-year-old was cutting it out with a knife. That's, that's amateurization. The fact an eight-year-old can do 3D printing is, is what I'm talking about. So those kind of barriers to entry and the cost of technology is obviously going through the floor all the time as well. So we're seeing much, much more opportunities given to us and our ability to create stuff. And it's creating this kind of subset industry that is not professional. It's amateur. And we are taking stuff, which may have been created by someone else, and playing around with it and changing it and doing cool stuff with it. And we don't have to ask for permission for it. Fourth one is money, which doesn't get talked a lot about at kind of conferences like this, because it's, it's boring and evil. And things like spreadsheets and job titles are just like, oh, why do I want to sit here and talk about spreadsheets and job titles? But it's interesting, I think, because if you look at marketing budgets these days, there's always a line on there now which says digital, it says social. You know, there is. People are putting those lines into their budgets because they're creating an ROI. There's a return on their investment on those things. They, they create awareness and they create profit. Um, so we're seeing that necessity. And <laughs> job titles, I mean, my old job title at the agency Think was um, I was the community strategist, which you know my mom still doesn't know what that means, and I'm not really sure what that means either. But those kind of those jobs are kind of coming up when we worked when I worked for Channel Four doing the kind of multi-platform experience around one of their TV programs, the first person we met was the multi-platform commissioning editor for drama. Um, you know, that, that job title didn't exist three years ago. But these people, these jobs are being created, and it's not just wanky marketing job titles. These jobs are being created because they do something, and they're having to be made, and they're being created. So it's interesting to see our industry kind of evolving like that. And the final one, the big one for me, is, is permission. So. This idea that we have now opened the toy box as far as our users and our audience are concerned, and a couple of, either, a couple of other people have spoken about this already over the past day or two. Permission is you don't need it anymore as a user to go in and play around with something you know, and create stuff based on other people's property. The means of production have completely shifted. And this is what scares a lot of people in traditional industries, whether it's you know, this idea of convergence, so TV, film, music, publishing, whatever. Yes, convergence is great and lovely, but can we just make sure we keep control of everything, please? Uh, no. If you're going to give your stuff out there to people and let them consume it, they're going to play around with it and tear it apart and create something new out of it. That's the world we are living in right now. And that's, that's quite scary for people, because they People like to keep control, control of their products, and they like to believe that what they're going to give someone is a finite, boxed-off thing that no one else can mess around with. But that's actually the opportunity here, I think. That's the massive thing, and that's kind of what I want to start looking at a little bit in terms of the challenges that these things throw up, is how can we take this idea that 
people are going to just tear stuff apart and play around with it and give you something back, which might be different and might possibly even better than what you gave them in the first place, and think about how we can make the best of that. Doctor Who. Um, I think that is, I don't know which Doctor Who that is. Anyway, <laughs> um, doesn't matter. It's the Lego one. Um, so I just want to kind of go through a few of these challenges um, that are kind of getting brought up by people who produce content or market this content or advertise this content or anything like that. And the idea that people can time travel now. So again, when we were working for Channel 4 at Think, one of the first things they told us was that 50% of people who watch their dramas on Channel 4 watch them time shifted, which is just a, you know, a marketing way of saying later on. So they will watch it on 4OD, they'll watch it on the web, they'll go by the DVD, they'll record it on their Sky Plus box or their TiVo or whatever, or they'll watch it on Netflix. Half the people who are watching that. Now, 10 years ago, you knew when that TV program was going to be on, you knew what time it was going to be on, you knew what day it was going to be on, and you knew there would be like seven days before the next one. So you knew when people were watching your stuff, so you could talk to them about that and knowing exactly at which point they were in. We can't do that anymore. At least half the people, I mean, that, that number's going to rise very, very quickly because this idea of schedules and stuff is disappearing, as we'll talk about. But anyone can do that now, and it's very difficult to talk to someone without knowing who they are, where they are, when they are, and what their emotions are, and what context they're in. And, and that's quite scary for us as marketers and content producers. And our experiences are becoming very atomized. With all these different screens and channels and things that we're getting, we're not, we're not, there's no big kind of communal experience anymore. If everybody's watching something at different times in different places, we can't, we don't know, we can't talk to everybody all at the same time. And that's good in a way because it forces us to get away from this kind of generic message which advertising has like traditionally been. But it's also incredibly difficult because if you go to someone like a TV producer or a magazine producer or a music producer and say, okay, we're going to talk to each one of your audience individually. What are you going to do? Just going to go around and knock on their doors? And that's something that's very timely and very, and very costly. So we have to start thinking about new and clever ways of, of dealing with that as a problem. It's the Matrix, kind of. This is actually from a, firm, a video that someone made of the Matrix from this fight scene all completely in Lego. It's worth looking up. It's really good. Um, but unlike Lego Neo here from The Matrix, we can't be in lots of different places at once. Um, and what's weird about this kind of multi-platform, transmedia, 360 degree, whatever buzzword you want to use, experience, is that content is starting to fight with itself. So we are creating um, meta content around core content like TV programs or films or something like that. And it's, having to, it's fighting for people's attention for, for the actual core products. I'll give you a really crude example, because I'm not explaining it very well. But the sexy vampire drama True Blood, anyone, everyone's familiar with that. <laughs> Quite dismal uh, drama from the States. Um, one of the TV networks in the States, when they were showing True Blood, decided they were going to put up the best of the tweets. Um, you know, let's do social media. OK, let's put the tweets on the TV screen as people were watching True Blood. And the, the little bit of the screen which was showing the tweets was about a third of the screen. So you couldn't see all the sexy vampire action. <laughs> so people were tweeting and going, take the tweets off the bloody screen because I can't see the vampire boobs. And that is a very kind of crude way of saying, you know, you can't, that's content, it's fine itself. But if I've got a, you know, if I've got my phone here and my TV there and my iPad there, we all know this, we all do this now, it's a kind of accepted behavior. But for marketers to have to try and think about attention spans around content and stop this kind of Russian doll effect where you've got content within content within content within content, which is all fighting within itself, that's really hard to do. And it's, um, again, when we were working with Channel 4 on this drama called Utopia, we read the scripts and it was a very intelligent, dark, complicated, conspiracy thriller. So you can't do a, a real-time second screen experience with someone's doing this when there's stuff happening over here on the screen because you're going to miss it. And then come the next episode, you're going to be like, I've got a clue what's going on. I'm just going to go watch Made in Chelsea. So you have to, attention has to find its own level. And I think, unfortunately, what we're doing is we're assuming attention spans a lot of the time. We're just throwing extra content and extra story at existing stories or existing content and hoping that it will fill people's need for this kind of thing. And it starts fighting amongst itself and it screws everything up. And that's a big problem for us as, as kind of content producers, I think, having to think about where these attention spans lie. I was going to get to Harry Potter eventually. Um, so th there are no sacred cows anymore, as I was saying. That, that those kind of permissions have, have disappeared. Um, and anyone can play with anything. 
And that's a very scary proposition, especially if you're in a, in a, in a boardroom with JK Rowling and you're creating a community site around her property. And you want to, and she, you know, if you say to JK Rowling, oh, yeah, we're going to let people play around with your characters and do whatever they want with them, they'll probably just end up having weird wizard sex. And she's not going to react very well to that because that's what's going to happen. It, it happens on other bits of the internet. Um, and because people are weird, they will do crazy, messed up stuff with, with, your, with your stories. Um, and what's interesting is that we, as content producers and as marketers, we have to go out and start thinking about what our audience want. And that sounds like common sense, but you'd be surprised, I think, and shocked how many brands and organizations don't think of that as a solution. They don't want to go out and talk to their users and go, okay, what do you want to do with this content? Um, they just either assume or they're scared that their users are insane or fanatical or stupid. Um, and which is weird, because they're the people who are paying or thinking about or talking about this content in the first place. So why are you ignoring them? So when we were building Pottermore, the first thing we did was go out and get like the people who ran nine Harry Potter fan sites from around the world and like, put them in a room with each other, which sounds <laughs> scary, and it was slightly. But it was also the best thing we could have done, because and you know the lawyers like you can't do it, you can't show them that you can't ask them because they'll just go out and tell everybody. No, they won't because they they see J.K. Rowling as a god. So for a start, they're not going to cross her. But also, they you're giving them your trust, and they're going to give that back to you in spades. And if you can start creating those relationships with users before content is produced, that's when things really start happening. And what you discover is that everybody needs a few rules and a few ba few boundaries. Nobody wants, you know, nobody wants a complete sandbox just to mess around with, because uh, that's just amorphous chaos. Nobody wants to be a part of that as a digital experience or anything. They need some kind of structure. Yes, they want to be able to play with stuff, and they don't want to be completely on rails. Nobody wants that either. And to find that middle ground, I think, is one of the biggest challenges in our industry right now. In giving things to people that aren't just finite, on rails, box stuff stuff, but also have a certain structure and say, here's something we think you might like, play with it, and then we can react to it. So for example, people who were looking forward to Pottermore, what J.K. Rowling was, was creating, didn't want to be able to just take those characters and do anything they wanted with them. They, they, there are fan fiction sites, which I don't suggest you go and read because it's very messed up, but they're, they're already out there. That already exists for them. And that's not from the creator itself. If it's coming from the creator itself, they expected something a little more rigid. And thankfully, J.K. Rowling had this kind of box of notes and annotations about the Harry Potter world under a bed or whatever that she'd never kind of used before. So we were able to take that content and put it around an existing kind of structure and let people discover that. And that's what people wanted. They wanted that kind of story, but they wanted to discover this stuff in their own time, in their own way. And it's that kind of mix of autonomy, but also playfulness and serendipity which if you can get the right balance of that, I think, then people will react to that very well. But it's very hard, and you have to go out and talk to your audience first to figure out exactly how you can make that balance happen. And that's, that's very, very tough, I think, a lot of the time. Breaking Bad. Um, you have Breaking Bad in Poland? You must have, yeah. Um, it's, you know, it's just methamphetamine. It's just an everyday conference slide um, in Lego. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, God, drug dealer and terrorist, good. I'm glad we got those in. Um, so like Jesse and Walt in Breaking Bad, we have to work together to create our Class A drugs. Um, convergence. It's all lovely, and we are all these different industries are having to work together to create you know, TV programs and music and publishing and digital and everything. But it's tough having to do you know, industries that have never worked together before having to come together and do cool stuff is not as, you know, it's not hippie nirvana time. It's really hard. Um, again, like TV, we sat down with Channel 4 and they, and they said, well, okay, what's this digital experience going to look and feel like? What's the look and feel of it going to be? And we said, well, you give us the credit sequence for the TV program and we'll build you know, the look and feel around that, so it kind of it melds in. And they just, they just sat there and pissed themselves for about a minute when we said that, because this was about a year before it went on air. And they said, oh, we build a credit sequence about two weeks before it goes to broadcast. It's like the last thing we do. And like, oh, shit. So, and it's those kind of timings, those kind of, you know, the fact that timing is crucial, yes, when you're cooking meth, but also when you're creating 
<laughs> transmitter experiences. Um, <laughs> um, it's, it, that's really difficult to get those kind of, you know, we're all working on different clocks. Um, again, you know, you're working for a TV. I got the chance to go on, on set when they were, they were creating this TV series, Utopia, that we worked on. And they were there changing the script as people were reading the lines. And you're like, ah, oh, crap. Because if you're million pound, you know, really clever, that you think is really clever, multi-platform transmedia experience, relies on someone saying those exact <laughs> words at a certain time, and, and they just scrubbed it out and go, no, I don't want to say that, you're screwed. And because our industries don't, you know, I've never worked together before, we're not aware of the dependencies. Um, another example is we put a post-it note in the, in the shot of one of the first episodes of this TV series. It had a URL on it that if you were a real nerd, you could freeze frame it, see what the URL was and go to it and, and discover something else. To get that post-it note in shot, we had to talk to the writer, the guy who wrote the script in the first place, the director, the producer, the script editor, the set dresser, the assistant editor, um, and about three or four other people to get a post-it note in, on a wall in the back of the shot. Because even if it got filmed, we had to make sure it didn't get edited out. And that is, you know, these two industries, when two industries, and that's what our industries are doing right now, not just TV and digital, but every industry, they we're all converging, and it's the, the, the kind of crunch as we come together is quite difficult to deal with. And, but it throws up some interesting opportunities at the same time, one of which is for me to use Breaking Bad in Lego. Um, so I, I kind of want to give, so those are the kind of the, oh God, isn't it awful? This is really challenging. How are we going to deal with all these kind of, all these problems thing? But I want to give a couple of examples of um, people who I think are doing it really well and are actually dealing with this stuff because there are people doing some interesting things out there. Um, and one of them is, is, is Netflix. Um, Arrested Development, anyone? It's Joe, the magician from Arrested Development. In Lego, that was the only thing I could find for us to development. Um, but House of Cards as well. So when when Netflix developed their first kind of produced TV series in their attempt to become HBO, before HBO became Netflix, as, as the as the guy who runs Netflix famously said, they went through. Well, they said they did this. I'm not sure if they did, but it's a good story anyway. They went through all the data that they had of all, everyone who'd ever like rented a DVD from them, or watched the film, or watched the TV series, or filled in a questionnaire, or spoken to them and kind of crunched all that kind of big Netflix data and said, okay, what our viewers, what our users, what our audience really want, apparently, is a remake of a UK 80s political drama starring Kevin Spacey. Um, and, and, and they were that specific. <laughs> Again, I don't believe that's entirely true, but that's what, and so they spent $100 million making 13 episodes of that, of that thing, and it was very successful by all accounts. But what they did, which was, even more revolutionary, because they could, because they're Netflix, is they put all 13 episodes on, online at once for you to download. And the entire TV industry went, well, what the fuck are you doing? <laughs> you can't do that. You have to give it to someone every week. You have to drip feed it to people. That's what they're expecting. That's how we do things. And they went, ah, sod it. Here you go. Here's all 13 episodes at once. And, and people consumed all 13 episodes in one go. <laughs> did. They just sat down and watched all in one day. And they had like online binge parties for House of Cards. And, What's interesting about that is that it just takes away. Yes, the schedule is is dead. You know, the the networks and the broadcasters aren't setting the schedule anymore. We are, and we're having to find interesting ways of doing that. And a kind of a, a Twitter collective binge party around all 13 episodes of House of Cards, no matter how unhealthy and slightly mentally unstable you have to be to do that, is a is an interesting you know, way that we're seeing this kind of natural collection of people coming around content without being told to by a broadcaster or an advertising campaign. And that's, that's how things are, are kind of developing. Um, Arrested Development, when they brought back Arrested Development, Netflix, because it had been cancelled originally, and they kind of, again, said, well, people want to see this, so let's, let's spend some money and make it. They, um, they kind of said, the rumor was that we were going to have um, all 13 episodes that you could watch them in any order. It didn't really work like, out like that in the end, but when I read that, the kind of producers would sort of kind of floated the idea that you didn't have to watch them in, in, you know, in the sequential, uh, in sequence. It was like, shit. You can imagine someone like J.J. Abrams who created Lost going, okay, here's a TV series of 13 episodes, 
watch it in whatever order you want, and you will have a different experience to the other guys watching in a different order. So we both watch the same TV series, but we both get a very different experience from it. And that's incredibly exciting from a creative point of view, but also from a marketing point of view, and from a consumer point of view. And also, they brought the rest of the development back, you know. Um, there's, it's an end to this idea, and they'd made two series before the first one had even aired. So they don't have to wait, you know. There's, no, there's none of this, okay, we're going to show a pilot episode to see how people react. And then we'll make the other 12 episodes. You just got to do it, and then it'll have that long tail, you know, hopefully, people will watch it. So there's an end to this kind of nervousness and cowardice around producing content now that we, can, we kind of got over, which is really interesting. Um, video games is another area which is where this kind of stuff is really having um, kind of a big effect. Uh, if anyone saw the Kickstarter campaign for Double Fine Adventure, Tim Schafer's project last year, it was one of the first projects on Kickstarter to break a million dollars. Um, and it was really interesting because what he was doing with Double Fine, this kind of video game, was saying, okay, we're going to make this video game. You're not going to, when you're paying us for a Kickstart, to Kickstart, you're not paying for the game. We're not going to send you the game, no matter how much you pay us. You're paying to be involved in the process of creating this game. And he actually says in the video, if you're going to watch it, it's still online, it's going to be an adventure, both the, both the product and the process. And that, in a sentence, for me, is kind of the future of kind of social marketing for what we're doing. People paying to be part of the process of creating a product, which is very hard to say when you're slightly hungover. But it's true. People want to be involved in creating something now. They don't just want to take the finite product at the end of it. They want to take it and do something with it, but they also want to be involved and, and, you know, and, and integrated in the actual creation of it. And that's what people are paying for on Kickstarter. And Kickstarter's kind of almost accidentally created this kind of this kind of process, and it's really, it's really interesting that this kind of buying involvement in a product before you actually buy the product itself, um, which is a bit weird. I'm going to, got a couple of minutes left, I'm going to end with a, a French philosopher, because it just talking about French philosophy makes me sound more intelligent than I actually am. Um, there, are, there are no Lego figures of, of Roger Calois, but he was French, so I'm assuming this is probably what he looked like. Um, <laughs> and what Roger... It's really not a very French name, is it, Roger? Roger. What he was um, saying while he was cycling to the bakery for more baguettes with his beret on was that there are two different types of play. Um, and he called one of them a ludus and the other one padia. And ludus kind of play is regimented, structured play. It's noughts and crosses. It's monopoly. It's anything which has rules and a structure to it and you know, progression and things like that. It's kind of what you think of when you talk about when, we, when we're talking about gaming and good gaming, and it's that's what you think of as games. But the other game, the other type of game which he kind of identified was this idea of pedia, which is unstructured gaming, and that is if you or play. And if you put unstructured plays when you put a kid in a sandbox and go go for your life, make something. There, there are no rules to it. There's no times around it. There's no prizes, and there's no you know there's no winning. They're just making something. Um, and obviously, the other example of that, see, it all comes around, I have actually thought about this, is Lego. If you put a kid in front of a big bucket of Lego, they can just make whatever they want, or a, or a tiny stormtrooper. Um, they can make whatever they want, and that is, that is how I think we should be thinking about our audiences now, is not, not tiny stormtroopers, that would be weird, but as people with a big bucket of Lego in front of them and no idea what they're going to make until they've actually made it. That's what we're giving to our consumers and our audiences and our customers these days. And we shouldn't be scared when they start building stuff that we don't really see, we don't, we don't predict. And, that's, and that's, so that's, I think, how we should be thinking about our consumers now. And that's it. Thank you very much. Here we go. And I'm back. Hey you can ask questions to Rob personally during the, the next break, but I've got a couple of quick ones for you, Rob. Okay. Take the centre stage so we can see you. We can pick you up on the camera because we are streaming out to the audience as well. Okay. Um, just a couple of things I wanted to pick up on, and it is quite messy out there when it ter in terms of content and what brands and companies and programmers should be doing at the mm -hmm. moment. But one of the, the trends that I've been picking up with, I'm just wondering wh whether you've been following this as well, is that brands are coming up with original programming ideas so they're putting... Content marketing. Content, yeah, content marketing. But yeah. whether it's comedy programs, whether it's drama, that seems to be the trend as a way of trying to get in contact with their audience. Yeah, I think I, I kind of try to avoid the phrase content marketing because it's not... It's, it's putting things in a, in a box like that is, it can be very dangerous, but you're right. And it, we were talking about this last night. It's almost a year to the day when 
um, a guy jumped out of space for Red Bull, yeah. you know, and they spent however $10 million making that happen. And, you know, that's an energy drink making someone parachute out of space. Um, and, but, you know, they're still getting hits on that video and that film. And it's one of the most, you know, it's an iconic moment. Um, and it's that kind of, and that's, that's, that's obviously content marketing done very well. And as we were just hearing about telling stories for brands is very well. And it's now it's kind of been taken to that next level. I think what you have to really be careful of is another example of this is kind of um, ARGs or alternate reality gaming, which is as, as a marketing experience. So, you know, the, the seminal kind of example of this was the Blair Witch Project. It wasn't called transmedia storytelling, then it was just called lying. <laughs> you know, this is a true story, honestly. And then people got, you know, sucked in by it. But now we kind of, if you look at what, how The Dark Knight was marketed and things like that, it's very experiential, it's very story driven. It's, you are going to dress up as the Joker and meet in Times Square at midnight and we'll project this onto a thing. Unfortunately, because the people who are creating some of these experiences and some of this content marketing come from content backgrounds and storytelling backgrounds, those stories are, they have beats and they have a beginning and a middle and an end and you have to go and find a clue and you have to then go and do this and then this happens. And again, it gets very regimented and very on rails and because people, that's what we're used to doing. We're used to giving people a story and go, watch it, finish, stop, okay, wait for the next one. And it's very difficult to get ourselves out of that mindset of allowing people to go, okay, here's some elements of a story, now do something with them. And I think that's where, in terms of content marketing, it's more about delivering the assets to create a story rather than delivering the story itself. And I suppose that's why Netflix and won an Emmy as well for House of Cards yeah. recently. And Lego... Also, Kevin Spacey's very good. He is very good, <laughs> isn't he? And, and Lego is a, a timeless story. And if you look at their website, their e-commerce offering, they've managed to regenerate themselves yeah, you and can appeal actually, to a younger audience you can, again. Yeah, and an older audience, in fact. I mean, if you look at the story of Lego, how they were nearly bankrupt a few years ago and they actually... A, went out and started talking to the people who buy their products and realized that an eight-year-old kid would spend $5 a year on average on Lego. A 40-year-old man, not, not me, but some people, will spend $5,000 a year on Lego. And they were like, oh, we should probably be marketing to that guy. Here's a 500-pound Death Star model, you know. So, and they realized there was a whole market they weren't talking to. They also realized that because what they couldn't do is when people wrote into them going, I am 12, I would like some Indiana Jones Lego, they couldn't they were like, no, we're not even going to open that letter because if we do make Indiana Jones Lego, you could sue us. Mm. And they had to start, they had to break down that relationship between the users and you know, the creative department and say, okay, we're going to start taking on your ideas and start talking to you, and which is a massive shift for a big organization like that who could, yeah. you know, and there's all those legal implications in it as well. But once they started doing that, then it opened a whole new world to them. So it's an interesting case. And I think from the audience's point of view, to check out the Lego story and the website and look at their, their offering that they do, their multi-channel, yeah. omni-channel presence that they have. Because I think it's out a, later this year, I think. It is, so. but, it, but it's a, I think it's a really good example. We've got to leave it there, Rob, because I'm in my ear, I've been told that we've got to leave it, although we could no, talk it's... forever. In the meantime, thank you very much to Rob Hinchcliffe. He will be around to answer your personal questions. Thank you, Rob. No it's been fascinating to talk to you. Yeah. Thank you.